What's happening, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio. We're doing another How to Fight episode, but this time we're talking about how to fight Chiwetel Ejiofor as Mike Terry in the, I don't know if we want to call it classic, the movie <laughs> Red Belt. And of course, joined as always on these episodes by Andrew Adams. Andrew, thanks How's for going, going Jeremy? I'm good. How are you, man? I'm great. Great day. And then bringing him back from episode 576. He's the one that picked this movie, Sensei Greg Williams. Greg, how are you? Good, man. Good to see you guys. Great yeah. to be back. Yeah, thanks for coming back. Thanks for, for your willingness to do this. You've got a rather fitting t-shirt on. Yes, Machado Brothers. Um, from Southern California, yeah. a big part of this movie, uh, the brothers, Machado Brothers. There's, I think there's seven of them and. um, at least two of them, maybe three of them were in this movie. Hegan, yeah. I didn't see him. Hegan wasn't in it, but I know Jean-Jacques Machado and John Machado were both uh, had some pretty decent roles in this. Yeah, if there's a family known for BJJ beyond the Gracies, it's the Machados. Yeah, well, it's uh, they are pretty much the um, the closest to the lineage, you know. Yeah. They're the highest, highest belts, yeah. along with the Gracies in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, yeah. Now, when we had you on, you talked a little bit about your experience. You, you've got some BJJ background, correct? With Higa Machado. Okay, that's what um, I thought. So, yeah, I did train down for a short period of time. I trained with um, Higa Machado when he was on a Pacific Coast Highway 1 in Redondo Beach, which was kind of like, um, if you, it goes back quite a ways. So, like Eddie sure. Bravo and, um, yeah, it goes, it goes back a ways. Like, they've moved... <laughs> since then but uh so when i say that people will know that this goes back to the mid 90s okay maybe mid, maybe late 90s something like that back when very few people were doing it yeah yeah and it was few and far between so i had to travel like uh, an hour and a half from palmdale california hmm. which is wow. way up north in the it's desert hike. and yeah it was a hike and that's i mean honestly i was not really um filthy rich like i am today <laughs> you know, as you can see all my riches around me. Um, back then, you know, I, I, I was struggling. You know, I was just moved out to California, living with my brother. So I couldn't get down to L.A. as much as I would like to and train with him. But every moment and every second I spent there, I loved it. Uh, just, I wish I could have done more there. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Andrew, do you... I, I, I've got on record my, my BJJ experiences can be counted in, in weeks uh how, how about how about you what's your what's your grappling background my uh, my bjj experience could probably be broken down into days days okay yeah i've got i mean more, I, I have more grappling experience than someone well i've done i've done a decent amount of japanese jiu-jitsu sure um but very little traditional brazilian jiu-jitsu okay so yeah, my right style on. is primarily japanese jiu-jitsu but um if i had to fight you two guys i think now you just told me how to fight it i think you both to the ground <laughs> because uh, <laughs> you just gave up limited experience so, yeah 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 but don't underestimate my, my style is uh brazilian as uh not brazilian jiu-jitsu but traditional japanese uh jiu-jitsu submission which cross actually crosses over quite a bit yeah um because brazilian jiu-jitsu came from uh mieda who taught the gracies uh japanese jiu-jitsu and they incorporated that into their own style in brazil yeah it, it's we, we we talk about this on the show all the time, you know, all these techniques that are written, that people say, oh, they stole or they, you know, there's only so many ways you can do this. Somebody right. has you in some kind of hold, you know, you've got a very few ways that you're coming out of that without injury. Yeah, yeah, no, very true. I think, um, you know, martial movement, first of all, a friend of mine always says martial movements, martial movement, you know, mm -hmm. move like a martial artist is a certain number of common denominators that um you know a balance and um focus and focusing your energy on certain aspects and know what to look for but um martial movements martial movement and like a postmodern theory everything's been done mm -hmm. so you know martial arts point. goes back so far yeah. everything's been looked at dissected and um it might look new i mean i remember uh, even the gracies when people started Gracie started to become popular and Machado started to become popular. People were like, oh my God, this is new. And then you would show them like a, um, an old video of like, uh, 
black and white video of somebody from like 1900 throwing somebody in a Juju Gitami armbar. It's like, wait a minute, that's that didn't come around <laughs> to the Gracies in the 50s. And I'm like, no, it goes way back <laughs> to the Samurai. It, you know, it's just how they blend it and how they uh, where they put the emphasis and that type of stuff is really, um, you know, that's what makes their style their own, and that's what you know. That's what I think we're all we're all kind of task to do in martial arts is take what you learn and make it your own and fit you and your style and you can create mm. you know you can create anything out of the movements so you know they just got a very popular style they had a very popular style based on a lot of the um, the fact that a lot of people were percussive and striking and there wasn't a lot of um, a lot of judo which yeah. translates really well to the ground because that's half on the ground half standing up but a lot of people weren't um used to fighting on the ground that's how that's how this sport became popular i, I was around when they were going around um building brazilian jiu-jitsu building the sport and um you know i did train with orion and hey and orion and Hoyce way back before they were popular they were going around doing the um the hundred thousand dollar challenge where they would put their oh, money yeah. up yeah, so I remember that. I mean, yeah, I mean, I was around when they were doing that, and um, you know, that popularized the sport because sure. people would mostly strike. And if you get if you're here on somebody, and they can't strike you, and you're on the ground, then it's the world they weren't familiar with, and there they had the advantage. And that so. that actually comes into play briefly in the movie. So why did you want to do this movie? Why did you want to unpack this one? Well, because I have a lot of um, I have a lot of knowledge of some of the participants in the movie. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you. Um, from because I was immersed in that world. This movie came out in two thousand and eight. Mm -hmm. I was immersed in that world in the early in the late nineties. So this is shortly at, not not that long after I moved out here in two thousand and one. Um, I don't know. You know who directed the movie was David Mamet, right? Now I, I I recognize that name, but I'm not quite sure why. I didn't go deep. Glenn enough. Gary, Glenn Ross. Never he's seen a it. famous screenplay. Oh, it's a great movie. You got to see that movie. I've heard it's uh, a great movie. He's he's one of the foremost um playwrights of our generation. Hmm. And he's okay. a very um if if you look him up, you'll see he's done he's done a ton of stuff. Uh, really high end, really great stuff. Um Glenn Gary Glenn Ross is one of my favorite movies. Actually, he went to college at Goddard in Plainfield. Oh, like like right there. His, it was like right yeah, there. Like literally right by you, Jeremy. Like, <laughs> I, I lived and in you, the apartments off Goddard for a year. So and did yeah. you know that a bunch of his uh, actor friends that became famous also went to college with him? No, no, I didn't. Like, do you know who William H. Macy is? Yeah. Yep. Did he go to Goddard? To with, with David yeah. Mamet. Yeah. David That's Mamet. a riot. Mamet. And, Mamet. and he studied... Mamet. He studied jujitsu for six or seven years before he wrote this movie. He was a purple belt under um, Hanato Magnum, mm. who came out to teach for the Machados. Mm. And when he came out to teach for the Ch Machados, he taught in the school closer to me. And I went down and trained with him a few times as well. So I knew Hanato. That's why I, I, that's why I love this movie, because I'm like, I know that dude. I know that. Gotcha. Dude. You know, it's like seeing all these people that I knew. And I knew uh, Hanato, um, he, I, I knew that he was, he's a very, very good instructor, really good guy. And I guess he promoted uh, David, Mam David Mamet to um, Purple Belt. Cool. Yeah. And so he was one of the instructors, like the Gracie's trained uh, John Molinas, you know, like mm -hmm. the, the great director, John Molinas. Um, you know, they were Hollywood, people were getting into it, like yeah. Ed O'Neill, who was in yeah. the movie. Ed O'Neill is in uh, Red Belt also. It's it's a small it's a small piece, but he's a he's a black belt. He's yeah, a BJJ yeah, yeah. black belt and has been for a while. Yes. Long time. Yeah. Yeah. Very serious about it. So I that's I, I find that really cool. Now, one other and Andrew and I were talking about this. We both missed it in the film. It was after the fact. No, I, I didn't miss it in the film. Oh, you, you didn't. OK, no. I, I missed it. Sorry, I misunderstood. I missed it in the film that Dan and Asanto was in there. I was like, who's that guy? Yeah, do you know you why? I think Dan I would have recognized him. I didn't. 
You know why Dan, Dan Santos in the movie? No. Because he's a very high belt under the Machados. Mm, he studies okay. with the Machados. When I used to go to um, Redondo Beach to train, I, I knew, see, I knew Dan Santo from um, Wally J. Mm -hmm. Wally J was good friends with him. And when Wally yep. J would come down to LA, he would come and um, maybe do a seminar at my school. He would also go down and visit Dan Santo and kind of kill two birds with one stone because he was coming mm -hmm. from San Francisco or Oakland, Alameda. So we would go down there, train with Dan Santo, then come up and do one at my school. And I got to meet uh, Professor Dan, Professor Inosanto. And then when I started training a little bit later with the Machados, I would, I would be going into class. It was maybe a 10 o'clock class. And he'd be finishing up a 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock private. So we'd pass. Yeah. He'd be like, hey, how you doing? I would always bow because that, that dude is just... Um, He's royalty. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's about as yeah. he's about as real as it gets for the martial arts. I mean, yeah. Bruce Lee's protege, and you know, so Wally J and Bruce Lee were very close, so they had a great friendship. And um, you know, so so I would go down there, and uh, I would pa in passing, I would see him and be like, "Wow, this is so awesome!" You know, like I'm here, I am, and it's like nobody else around, and I'm passing yeah. Nina Santo for a class. And then um, <laughs> I did see later on. That you know, he's achieved a very, very high rank in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with the Machado brothers, which speaks to his, um, speaks to his, his um, he philosophy. He likes to learn. Yeah, yeah. his life, his philosophy of training in different styles and yeah. learning as much as you can as for as long as you can. I mean, he's not a, he's not a young guy anymore, no, but he's, he's still not. doing it. And, you know, and I, I give him so much credit and um, I really, I think I respect him probably more than more than anybody in martial arts, really, for for what he's done, who he's affected. Yeah. I mean, he's a great, and he seems to be such a great guy. So, yeah, yes, yeah, I love Danny Santo. So let let's let's start digging into it. And actually, before yeah. we get there, there there's one piece, and and I've I've got to say this, and, and I think the three of us need to chat about it just just for a minute or two. There's a moment in this film that I think is a complete breakdown of everything the martial arts stands for, and I don't know how it made it in this film. And and you, I'm you're nodding your head, Greg. I'm I'm guessing you know what I'm talking about. I I've noticed a couple of moments, but I I, I messaged Andrew while watching it. I almost had to stop watching the movie because it was so abrupt and so um, it seemed so representative of people who it didn't make sense to me. And it's the moment where the woman and says, "I was raped." And, and he grabs her. Mike Terry grabs a knife and puts it to her throat immediately after that. Uh, I, I've never known an instructor who would respond in that way. If I did, I would probably never speak to them or be in their company. Uh, and I can't imagine they would retain students because that is so over the top uh, and, and insensitive and arrogant and so many other words that I'm just not going to use on this show. Yeah, I I would have to agree, but I would also have the caveat that I mean, in a movie context, um, yeah, it's it's wrong. I I totally agree. I've dealt with students that um, had this PTSD, as she seemed to have, around this subject and about this type of thing, and. The only way, the way I really broke through it was to have them fight through that scenario. Mm -hmm. That being said, I didn't just do it. Right and, and, that, and that's the key. It wasn't in the first 15 minutes you knew them. That's the big, yeah. Seconds after she tells me, right. Yeah. Like, this yeah. Is, yeah. So there was a lot of talking like, okay, this is planning. This is what we're going to do. If you ever feel uncomfortable, you know, I'll back off, but we need to push the limits so that you're not, so that you are, you don't black yep. out. I had a student. That's very different. That, the yep. student used to black out when somebody would like overpower her. There was something going on and we fought through that. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of talk and a lot of, um, um, yeah, a lot of things to make sure that the individual is safe. Sure. Yeah, my my wife, you know, if you've watched all the how to fights, um, you've noticed that my wife has always watched with me 
due to circumstances beyond my control, she was not able to watch the movie with me this time. Mm -hmm. And it's good because she would have, she would have gotten up and walked out and not watched yeah. the rest of the movie for that one scene. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll tell you something. Um, when I, when I watched this and when I thought about it, you know, David Mamet is a very, very accomplished and revered um, a screenwriter and playwright. And I was going to, you know, I, I don't want to criticize his writing, you know. I, I don't want. I don't like to criticize. I do agree with you on these points. I I feel like, without getting political, he shifted from um, from very left to almost far right, and this is almost. He, he's very much against political correctness, from what I understand, from what I've read about him. Um, you know, uh, you think that this, this, that that's how it showed up? in his writing that it was almost uh i i think so i think he's okay, like i, I don't see care that. what you know i think yeah. there's a certain boldness to his his action and you know so what if it pisses off people you know sure I think, uh, I, the, the only the only reason i felt we needed to say that was one people needed to be prepared because it, it, it's a it is a situation that uh when it comes up in film can be difficult for for people uh yeah, and then two point. A anytime I think someone misrepresents the martial arts and what happens in the martial arts in a negative light, such that it might impact someone else training. I'm going to, I'm going to speak on it. Yeah. Um, that you should. That's well, you should. That's so let's, fair. let's start digging into it. How, how would you fight Mike Terry? You know, as we go through the film, you know, what did you see Greg that you were noticing? Ah, Okay. I would, you know, I'd remember this, I'd avoid this, I'd go after that. Yeah. How do you build your fight strategy? Well, right off the bat, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a sport. And, you know, if I was fighting him in the final scene, um, it'd be different than if I was fighting him if they went into the ring or the cage. Mm. You know, so we have to qualify or quantify that. Like, it's... You know, I make a clear difference between a street fight and a um, and a cage fight, sanctioned or not sanctioned. You know, if you're in a cage and there's rules, there's rules. Uh, there's no such thing as a dirty fight for me if it's a if it's a fight for your life. So I would I would be real dirty. I would be real dirty. And you, you know, they, they focused a lot, and I like the fact that they they had some really clean judo techniques. They had good throws. They had, there wasn't a whole lot of wrestling takedowns and stuff. There were a few, but um, it seemed like a lot of the uh, stand up to ground was, you know, hip tosses, mm. a lot of hip toss throws, a lot of in close, maybe a kubinage or um, ogoshi, you know, some judo throws, which I like. Um, I would, number one, I would counter, I would counter those by, you know, not letting my hips get in there or by creating separation of our hips, but I would fight really, I really would fight dirty and I would go a little, I would keep a lot more distance and um, I would really use my striking and boxing a lot more because you mm -hmm. see the shift even from, from what was really um, popular at 2008 in MMA, you know, the curve has gone up and down. Like it'll go from the Gracie started with, ground grappling and then once um once people figure that out they had to um figure out how to not get it to the ground so and, and strike and then wrestlers became really really powerful and strong because they figured out uh, where the brazilian jiu-jitsu game was going mm -hmm. not that they could nullify it completely but it became more wrestling heavy and then it became more striking heavy you know staying on the outside so i think at this particular point in 2008 I would really use a lot of footwork to stay outside and drop shots from uh, more, maybe even more of a karate, karate style mm. where I would do a lot more up kick and, you know, maybe not even kick so much, but my hands from a distance. Yeah, and I would, I would keep angles and distance really in my favor as much as I could and really make them work for that takedown mm. and anti-wrestling anti takedowns, anti-judo techniques. 
Andrew, we, we've really only got a few scenes that we can pull from. Of course, we've got that big fight at the end. Yeah. And then yep. we've got a few things sprinkled throughout. You know, I'm guessing you were you were putting some pieces together long before that final fight. You know, what yeah. sort of stuff were you seeing? So in, in his, his the first actual fight that he gets into was in the bar. Uh, and, you know, my first initial thought was, why didn't he just walk away? Like, why did he have to get involved in the first place? That surprised me a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, you know, he did say in later on the movie, the, the hardest step is to leave the outside outside. Like he could have just been outside. Uh, so I was surprised at that. But when he finally did get involved in the fight, uh, he was very good with the, with his cane, right? Using an imp improvised weapon, mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, grabbed a cane, used it like in a scrimmage stick. It was really good. And he also did a really good job with his situational awareness, right? He got a guy down on the ground and had him in a lock, but was aware enough to be continually looking around him and defend himself against other people that were standing up. And so, you know, he's obviously very, uh, observational, in his uh in his fighting that's yeah. a, that's a really good point he was like on one knee and he yep. had that cane locked around him to choke it was good and actually the guy he was choking okay so that was i bet you i bet you couldn't tell me who it was no idea. i can tell you he was a bad guy that's all i could tell you his name is dennis Kiefer. he shows up in a lot of movies as a bad guy he's a stunt fighter and i was part of the uh, he was part of the stunt team that I was on with Benny Urquidez. Oh, cool. You know, six or seven people. And I'm like, I see him pop up everywhere. This guy, I mean, he, he's a, got a great look for a bad guy. Well, he's actually a pretty good looking guy. And uh, he uh, I, he shows up everywhere. And I was like, mm. there's Dennis Kiefer. He's in this stuff. Oh, that's cool, nice. you know? So, yeah, it was fun to see him in that. And you're, I, I agree with you 1,000%. Um, very aware of the next attack coming when he's down there. It was good to see that instead of him having his eyes and his head down, yep. focusing on the choke where somebody could come and kick him in the head. So yeah, that's a great observation. The, the first thing I noticed was actually something I noticed pretty much throughout his principles to the point of arrogance. Hmm. <laughs> he, this character, Mike Terry is about as arrogant as a guy as I've seen, and you see it happen in all these little ways. Um, you know, not avoiding fights when he can. Um, his virtual indifference at having his, his window shot out. I mean, the number of things that had to go wrong for that to happen just blew my mind. I, I, I was sitting there because it's the beginning of the movie and I'm just going, it, yeah why is your gut out why is a round chambered uh why is no one saying anything who is this woman why is no one addressing her like if oh and you got kicked off the force i'll take care of it i'll take care of it don't worry about it don't worry oh. about it you got kicked off i know it's just your livelihood and your job and your family but give me a couple minutes i'll go talk to somebody and see what i can do and i'm gonna go find out why the guy gave me a hot watch yeah it like like i mean yeah it was arrogant and then even walking through at the final scene when he's plowing mm -hmm. through everybody you i know, like i made it i made a I made a note that when he's trying to get to dylan flynn played by you know ufc randy champion couture. randy couture right when he's trying to get to dylan flynn and get to the stage why isn't he moving with purpose I mean, why isn't he jogging, sprinting, running? He's just slowly walking. Why? That way he that... can fight everybody. That way he can fight. Yeah, it was very arrogant. Yeah. And, 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 and I right. will say that when he did that, like his movements were, were good. Whoever choreographed that did a phenomenal job. Very tight, very good movement. I, I liked that part. Yeah. But I think, you know, we've all had enough freeform movement with partners that arrogant fighters they always get what's coming to them you know that's the irony of being arrogant is that it's never someone really good who takes you out it's someone you completely underestimate and yeah. yep that that's about all i would have going for me because <laughs> he's a little bigger than i am he's not a lot bigger than i am but big enough that 
you know, with, with my grappling skill set, the moment he locks me up, I'm probably done other than the fact that, you know, depending on what the situation is, you know, I'm a biter. I don't mind. You know, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take a chunk out of your, out of your ribs. That's fine. And maybe, yeah. maybe that would give me enough space. But I think other than that, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to have to stand up and I'm going to have to coax him into doing something that he thinks is uh, beneath him. So you're saying you would fight dirty also? Oh, yeah, I, I would always fight dirty. Yeah. With, with a guy like this, who I don't think has a non-dirty way of fighting, there was nothing right. we saw that, that despite what he said, his principles did not seem to extend to his technique. His willingness to take things to a violent place beyond where they needed to be suggests that the backstory on this character is horribly conflicted. Yeah, you know, the, the writer and director really is known for having a lot of uh, dialogue, you know? And I almost feel like a disconnect between like these really cool fight scenes and the dialogue and what's going on, like you say, behind the scenes, what's going on in their head behind this. Like it doesn't, it seems a little incongruous to have, um, you know, these principles and values, but then these cool fight scenes yeah. and a lot of talk. It was just a, there was a lot going on. And I think that's probably ultimately what kept this movie from being really success, really successful. I mean, it was, a, it's a, it's a good movie, but it's not, it could be so much better. Mm. It could be so much better if I think a lot of those holes that you talk about were filled in and he was a little more virtuous and portrayed himself more virtuous in his actions as opposed to just what he was, what he was saying. Now, this is this the first real like big movie? I mean, I say put big in quotes, it wasn't huge, but like first mainstream movie that really focused on bjj like i mean this I is the so. i mean it's the first movie um, we've done in how to fight that has that but were there other movies that really were as big as this that focused on bjj stuff i will tell you um that these guys the machado brothers um oh no I'm, I'm sorry take that back the gracies choreographed um lethal weapon the fight scene the you remember the final fight scene yeah. with the weapon with the rain coming down in the on the front lawn but i would but i, I would think, say greg that that's yeah. but that movie is not a movie about bjj right correct right there correct. i mean there way have been movies that had bjj in it but i'm talking about this movie was clearly about bjj and i think a lot of the the issues that we have with the movie uh kind of paint bjj in a bad light which and, is really yeah, disappointing. It's really unfortunate. I, I agree uh, because I don't think it's all like that, but I think there are some bad stereotypes in it mm -hmm. about the BJJ community that I don't think this movie helped uh, a sway. That's a good point because, you agree. know, if you think of the director being a purple belt and really falling in love with the art and putting the time in to get there and training with these people who I know are great. These are great. These are, yep, yep. I mean, the, they're the good guys of BJJ. Yeah, They're really, really like if I if I ever see him, if he comes up here, I go to California and I see him. It's like the love is tremendous. You know, he's just a really great guy. And um, there, there a lot of them are like that. And, and it's it's weird that the director might have sacrificed all that for a storyline mm. and for, you know, the sake of the dialogue. Why? Why wouldn't he go the other direction? you know, and make it really um, highlight all the great aspects of it, of, you know, and, and what movie have we seen that does that? Maybe Warrior? Um, mm. Like, but that's a cage fighting movie. That's not BJJ. There was one that just came out. I can't, uh, honestly, I can't remember it. And I, but I remember watching it. It was, it was about a guy that owns a BJJ gym. And I, when I watched it, I just said, you know, it can be so much better. It can be so much more inspirational. It can be done better. And uh, I guess it's up to us to create that movie, you know, or yeah. me, if you guys, you guys can help me, but I mean, I'll sure. choreograph it. Sure. <laughs> you know, I don't say no to hard work and effort that has no financial return. <laughs> <laughs> kind of the story I, of my if life. We make, if we make a great BJJ movie that's inspirational and, and uplifting and, 
phenomenal. I think um, I think there's a market there that make a lot of money. I think I the agree. hard part is making that make that movie. So many people <laughs> yeah. love it. Yeah. I, I felt like there were some scenes that might have been cut. Just the the flow of the movie. Mm. There there were some things, and it was already hour and a half, hour thirty six. Yeah. And I, I felt like maybe there were some things getting trimmed. The budget was seven million. It made half of that, not even half that at the box office. Yeah. So, you know, I'm wondering if things got away from them, you know, and they made some sacrifices in editing or something to to save some save some money. Yeah, it looks like the uh, budget was really there was a lot of um, there was a heavy, heavy, some heavy actors in there. I mean, yeah. Jennifer Grey, Tim um, Allen, Tim Allen. Um, Joe Montaigne, mm. David Paymer. Yeah. Those, they're big. Um, even Ricky, um, oh, what's his name? Oh, come on. Ricky, Ricky J. Ricky J. I don't know who that is. The heavy guy with the beard, the promoter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. I did Remember recognize him. From, him. from Boogie Nights. Yeah. He was like one of the camera, the cameraman or the, one of the guys in Boogie Nights. He's also a comedian, Ricky J. But yeah, yeah, you're right. The actor fees would have been pretty yeah. pricey for this. A lot of a lot of budget, Ed O'Neill. Let's let's bring it back. Let's let's dig in on the weaknesses because I think we're we're pretty much on the same page on the strengths. His grappling's a strength. He's strong. He's got decent technique. But where are the holes? No striking. No, no striking. Punching, no striking. No distance. No, no real, you know, no display of footwork. You, mm-hmm. If it's going on, you don't, they don't highlight it. You don't see it. I mean, I know it's not a boxing movie, but uh, any kind of MMA fighter, if you got bad footwork, it's exposed right away, mm-hmm. whether it be stand up sure. or on the ground. You got to be, you got to be able to move like a martial artist. Um, and it, it, it might have been there, but it wasn't really displayed. You know, they didn't. And if, it, um, if, if we didn't see it, it doesn't exist. That's right. right. Those are our rules on this on this show. That's right. And a lot of the shots were were, you know, in close and tight. And it's a trick to uh, it's a real trick to film um, grappling. It's a real trick to sure. film that close in stuff. It's not easy. It, it's hard to make it translate. And I think they did a good job with that. But then again, when you talk about a weakness, um, distancing and striking. Andrew, anything that we're yeah for we missed um I, I don't know that you missed it for for me if i was going to be have to get into an altercation with him uh absolutely i'm not getting anywhere close to him he is way too good and my jujitsu bjj or japanese uh, otherwise is not nearly as good as his so i'm staying on the outside for sure and he also has really good upper body movement. Like he was mm-hmm. good at maneuvering like a boxer would. So when I do come in with my strikes and it would absolutely be strikes, I'm not actually going to go full force with everything because mm-hmm. it's going to leave it extended. It's going to be more lots of smaller jabs, which will be harder to, for him to, to grab onto keeping, you know, keeping away with that footwork. And then all of my kicks are going to be to his knee and Look. lower. I'm not. I don't want my my kick anywhere up by his waist where he can easily catch it because I'm screwed at that point. So it's working the angles, popping you know little jabs here and there, not going for full power. I'd rather wear him down little by little, and keeping those kicks those kicks nice and low. Hmm. Totally agree. Totally agree. And here's um here's where, I mean the me now as opposed to the me back then would fight if um, I'd throw my kicks low, but I'd whiz, I'd throw one kick high by his head and I'd make sure it was far enough where he couldn't catch it because I'd want to see how he reacts to it. Yeah, I want to okay. see the reaction. And I tell my fighters when I used to coach MMA, I tell them, you know, throw that out there and watch for the reaction. And I would also throw a lot of fakes. I would, I would throw a lot of kick fakes, and a lot of shoulder fakes to see and get a read on how they react. Because if they're dropping levels, every time you go to throw a high kick and they're dropping their levels and you fake the high kick and you come up the middle with a, with a medium range or medium level kick to the face. Mm. So, what yeah. about you? What about you, Jeremy? I, I think the big thing that, that I'm remembering is that he didn't seem to know what to do with getting punched and getting kicked. You know, as someone who 
was probably more of a career grappler than a career fighter. You know, certainly he knew how to take a shot, but there's that that part at the end where, you know, he's he's getting choked and, you know, it sucks. You can tell he's he's not enjoying it, but he's comfortable. He's been there before. He's been there a bunch of times. Yeah. But when he's getting punched in the face, his hands aren't even coming up late. They're just not coming up. And I think that that's what I would have to do now. Now, typically on how to fight because I'm a smaller guy, I'm talking a lot about leg kicks. And I think I'm still talking leg kicks, but in a different way. Instead of a, a, a front, you know, a forward facing stance, which is what he's going to be used to. It's what he's going to expect. I'm turning sideways and I'm attacking that knee and that thigh probably with a lot of movement you know i i'm i'm bouncing around i'm launching off that back foot and i'm looking to 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 break down that thigh because if he can't stand he can't fight and i think that that's probably my best shot i probably only have two of those before he gets wise Mm. so i'm doing something you know fakes i'm you know throwing something high trying to confuse him as to what i'm gonna do and seeing what happens yeah it makes sense yeah yeah i would just be weird very weary of um if you turn too far to the side that they get around your back mm-hmm. you know that that's um that's what i would really look out for but yeah mm-hmm. i i have no problem with, with that at all you know using your kicks nice low kicks would be um would definitely be the way to go anything we've missed from the from the movie i don't i don't think so i would like i I wanted to talk about the um kind of the overarching the whole yeah let's premise and everything like let's wrap it with that i still use i still use the um the analogy there's always a way out right Mm. like even from watching that was the best part of the movie was that and that backflip yeah because he started out with that in the very beginning he's telling the police officer breathe relax there's always a way out you know and Mm -hmm. we all know that from martial arts that Mm -hmm. you got to stay calm so he's taught he's telling us to stay calm he's telling this guy to stay calm and then he practices what he preaches at the very end because he stays calm as he's getting choked like Mm. he said and then he runs up the wall and does a backflip i mean I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, unrealistic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's good. I, I just wanted to know how come um, right after that, when he choked John Machado, why didn't John Machado run up the wall and do it? They could just keep <laughs> doing it again and again and again. That would be pretty funny. But, um, but I like, I like, you know, that there's always a way out as a philosophy of life, you know? Um, and I think the, the police officer that, that took his life, mm. um, by suicide i think you know he didn't get that he didn't there is a way out of that problem you know mm-hmm. that life you know we have to make sure that we let people know it's all, never that bad it's never that bad that um you know if there's not a way out there's always a way out. it might not always be great it might not always be rainbows and unicorns but it, this is, that's there's that's a not a way out yeah that is not a way out I, I liked that message from the movie for sure. It was definitely one of the things I liked the most. The other thing that I really liked was actually the concept of uh, occasionally training with an impairment, you know, mm, having to yeah. draw the rock. Like, that's very realistic because it might happen. Um, you know, I mean, it, it sounds gruesome, but we sometimes in our dojo, we will get, we'll get on our belly and have to move from one side of the floor to the other using only our arms, mm-hmm. no legs at all. And our, my sensei says, what if you are, God forbid, in a car accident and you have to get from point A to point B because your legs are broken, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it might happen that you have to defend yourself with only one arm. And I think that was really, really cool uh, and pretty realistic. Is it something that an actual tournament would ever do? Absolutely not. It was really good for the movie. Um, and it's a really cool thing to do in real life, but obviously in, in, a, in an actual tournament, they would never do that. Yeah. 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 You I know agree. the escape. You know the he, he Yep. I didn't like it at the beginning when he was saying it, you know, 46 times. <laughs> but when he he lived to he lived to that rep that advice at the end, I thought that was that was pretty powerful and and that's the common threat 
I mean, you guys have both hit on it in different ways. That was absolutely the common yep. thread. Yeah, I, yep. I agree. You know, we, when we do boxing drills, you know, you talk about head movement. So moving side to side, back, whatever. I have my students tie their hands behind the back and mm. the other person, not, not throwing hard because they're at a disadvantage, but learn to move your head without your hands up, you know? Sure. So learn yeah. how to be fluid and get comfortable then it becomes so much easier when your hands are up. So those, those are the type of drills we do. Great point. All right. Great. Thanks for being here. Thanks for yeah. doing this. My I wouldn't pleasure, have watched man. this movie otherwise. This, I remember when it came out, it slipped through. I forgot about it. So I'm glad that we had the chance to do this. Yeah. And, and I know we criticize a little bit, but it is just a movie. That's I okay. Mean, <laughs> we I criticize all the problem. movies. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Martial artists watching a martial arts movie. Of course, we're going to criticize it. Of I course, mean, we're going to rip, only, it, rip it apart. The only one that doesn't deserve it is Best of the Best, obviously. Oh, uh, here we go. I but know. the last thing I would like to say is that how do I mute if, you? Where's where's that button? <laughs> I don't have a button I can mute you. There it is. If uh, and we say this at the the end of most of our how to fights that if Chuatel would like to come on, yeah, we would love to have him come on. And Greg, uh, hopefully you'd come back and and do a, do a wrap a wrap up with Chuatel if he came back. Uh, you know, bring him on, and um, I would love to do that, man. That'd and I love you guys for doing this. I I, I really uh, appreciate you bringing me on. Uh, this is I love this. This is great. It's my passion. I love I love films and I love martial arts. So nice. Nothing better. Awesome. And I love you too. So I think, thanks, man. Thanks for coming on. Thank All right. you. You watching, you know, what did you think? Did we miss something? Is there something that you want to respond? The best thing to do is to comment in one of the many places, whether it's the Facebook behind the scenes group or we post this video. Yeah, there's a video version on our YouTube page. So check that out. Let us know what you think. And if you've got ideas for a future how to fight, let us hear that too. So. Thanks, everybody. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.